training Professor Costin. It's going to be a great day and we're going to go see some landmarks. As per your request, beignets. We've started our day good. See you at the landmark. Uh, hello, my name is Claire Gates. Um, I am in class 2306, section N03. Um, we are currently headed to Chalmette, Louisiana, which is about five miles southeast of uh, New Orleans. We are on the Creole Queen boat tour that takes you to the uh, Chalmette Battlegrounds. Um, uh, the date is... Uh, no. Hold on. It is June 28th, 2019. Sorry, I apologize. I did forget the date. These are my cousins peeking in the background. Um, I'm on a family vacation, um, but I took the opportunity to do some schoolwork um, and get a little bit of extra credit. So I hope you enjoy this video. Hi, so with my family, um, we're on the Creole Queen um, little like cruise liner boat. We just floated down the Mississippi and we are currently about to walk into uh, the park um, where the battle took place um, in January 8th of 1815. Um, so, see you in the park. Um, so now we are at the battlefield. Um, so some of the information is uh, the British had planned uh, for three prolonged attacks, um, included the capture of the river end of the American rampart. Um, on the morning of January 8th, uh, British Major General John Keane sent advance troops to uh, Colonel Robert Rennie along the river road to attack the redoubt. Meanwhile, uh, British Commander Sir Edward um, Pakeham um, ordered Keane to lead most of his force to the field to support the main attack by the swamp. Though Rennie's troops captured the rebound, um, fierce American counterattacks pushed them back, inflicting heavy losses and killing Rennie. The Americans recaptured the uh, rebound and ended the attack along the river. Um, so this is kind of like part one of the battle, um, and then we will move on to part two down here. Okay, so now over here, um, we actually have a memorial um, of the man who fired the first shot of the battle. Um, his name is um, Major Samuel Spots. Um, he shot the first shot at the Battle of New Orleans um, on January 8th, 1815. Um, he was in the 3rd Regiment, uh, 7th uh, Battery Artillery Corps. Um, he was born on November 30th in 1788 um, in Philadelphia. Um, and he died here July, um, and well, he died here in New Orleans, July 11th, 1833. Uh, so now I move on to the second part of the battle, uh, located where the levee sits now, uh, Battery 1 and the, uh, Redoubt anchored, uh, the river end of the American defenses. On January 6th, 1815, uh, construction began on the Redoubt and enclosed defense, defensive structures, um, in front of the rampart. On January 8th, this area and particularly, oh, and partially, I apologize, um, finished rebound were defended by the U.S. regulars and uh, Beale's rifles. This is my cousin Hannah, um, a military unit made up of prominent citizens from New Orleans and uptown American uh, sector who organized when the British throne arose. During the attack along the river, British troops captured the rebound and stormed the rampart, but were driven back. Um, on December 25th of 1814, um, American Major General Andrew Jackson began fortifying uh, the Mississippi River West Bank, but January 8th, it was defended by nearly a thousand Kentucky and Louisiana uh, militia men and several artillery batteries, some armed with cannons from the American fleet. Uh, British Commander Sir Edward uh, Pakenham um, recognized the dangers of these guns posed on his troops on the east bank and included an attack on these positions in his battle plans. Delays in the west bank assault resulted in a British victory that came to came too late to salvage the disa disastrous uh, defeat on the east bank. No trace of these batteries remain today. Um, so now we're going to move on to kind of um, like more parts of the battle um, and up here I believe um, there's kind of like an informational place um, so we'll go there next. 
Um, the Rodriguez and McCartney Plantation served as the American camp during the Battle of New Orleans. Major General Andrew Jackson used the upper floors of the McCarty House um, as his headquarters and observation posts, allowing him to monitor the British movements and relay orders to his forces. Uh, the American rampart was uh, built on the neighboring Rodriguez Plantation. The Rodriguez House served as the headquarters and the artillery observation post. Both properties uh, suffered heavy damage, partially from artillery fire, but primarily from the Americans' uh, clear vegetation to set up camp um, and used wood for the fences to build the construction uh, defenses. The Rodriguez Plantation is right here behind me, uh, right there. Um, but now we're going to move on to the next part of the battle. Uh, so now just some information about the Rodriguez Canal. Um, built as a uh, mill race that provided water to the power sawmill, uh, by 1815 the Rodriguez Canal had been long abandoned. Uh, with its collapsed banks and grass-covered bottom, the canal resembled a ditch more than a waterway. Um, but it provided a perfect defense for... Um, defense position for Major General Andrew Jackson and his men. American troops and slaves from the area uh, plantations dug out the canal and used its soil to build the rampart stretching from the Mississippi River to the Cypress Swamp, which is, um, if you kind of can't see it, but it literally, the Cypress Swamp is kind of back here. Um, it's just all this area. It's actually really, really cool. Um, but when the rampart was completed, um, the canal filled with water and formed an imposing line of defense. Um, but I really did want to see, um, the cemetery and kind of include the cemetery, um, but unfortunately we don't actually have enough time, um, in our tour to do the cemetery as well. Um, so I will include the information about the cemetery in the, uh, following clip, um, to kind of just give you a little bit of information. But if you can kind of see over here, that is the canal that they dug out. Um, so it's kind of just reverted back to kind of like a swampy type thing. Um, but this has been a really, really cool place. Um, I'd love to see some more. I may include uh, other landmarks in here as well um, as we travel throughout the day. Um, so see you in the next clip. generous, but odds are they're going to keep New Orleans even if the treaty is in fact being negotiated. For that reason, the defense is pretty important. To defend, we will have General Andrew Jackson arrive on the scene. He has to figure out several things after he arrives. Where are the British coming from? Who do I use to defend the city? And where am I going to make my stand? first question is answered on December 24th, 1814. If you often see 
the radio towers or the cell towers on the opposite side of the tree line. That's just that way to To reach that point, they have to row in 60 miles from the fleet anchorage, then wade their way through swamps, bayous, and all sorts of nasty until they reach Mississippi. You also got to keep in mind, it's cold. It's January and December. It's below freezing in Louisiana at that point, so the British are trying not to freeze to death during the night. They wake up, there's a frost on the ground. However, they do reach the river, and they start to march up the river towards New Orleans. They surprise some American militia beyond the modern battlefield. General Jackson is warned by one of those who manages to escape. Well, he now knows where the British are coming from. And after hearing the news, Jackson would exclaim that by the eternal, they shall not sleep on our soil. That's a really wonderful line, and he is passionate. It's a bit premature. Jackson orders a night attack, again, off the modern battlefield, around where that industry is. But there's an issue fighting at night in 1814. Anybody might know what that is? It's dark. Yeah, it's night. It's dark. You can't see where the other. You can't see where the enemy is. You probably can't see where your own forces are either. You know, if someone is standing at that next oak tree, odds are you can't make them out if it's cloud cover and there's no moonlight. So the night attack is confused. It doesn't work for the reason it's a night attack. But the British have to stop and think. Do we keep marching up river? They decide no. And General Jackson has time to pick a spot to defend and then dig in. But before defending, he has to figure out, who am I going to use to defend? The answer is really whatever he can find. His troops are a hodgepodge of regular army, mostly militia, primarily Louisiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Also, some Choctaw Native Americans, and most interestingly, privateers or pirates, depending on how you view them, under, the, under Jean Lafitte, who know how to shoot cannon, which comes in handy when trying to defend against an invading army. That in mind, he has his army, but for most of these guys, if I would give you a rifle or a musket and train you how to use it for a few days or a few hours, you now have the some military knowledge of most of the troops on this line. So to compensate, Jackson will dig in, and he's going to dig in. Anybody guess where he's gonna dig in? Right there. Right there. That's why the boat dropped you off here today. He's gonna to find a little canal, which the vestige is still there today, and it's not much larger when he finds it. His idea is dig out the canal, make a, make a moat, then behind it, pile on dirt, logs, and wood where you can stand and shoot at the British. Across the field is a muddy mess of plowed sugar cane. So nasty, cold, muddy, your boot's gonna stick in the muck. On that side is even worse, it's a swamp. On this side, it is a river. So there's only one place you can attack, which is right there. Which brings me to the question, does anybody want to dress in bright red and march across an open field in the freezing cold against the fixed defensive line? Yeah. That doesn't sound very good, does it? They know that. The general in charge knows that. So they will try to think of a better plan. The first idea is knock us out with artillery. That doesn't work. So after about a week and a half, they realize they have to now walk across the field to support that, the British will supposedly lay in troops on the opposite shore, turn our own cannon against us, and now the functional assault doesn't seem so impossible. Now that's a really good plan. The bad news is that on the morning of January 8th, the British General, Edward Packingham, will find his plan completely falls apart. The troops that cross the river are swept downstream by the current, and they are no longer in our picture. So the most important part of the plan will not happen. On this side of the river, the British will march across the field and attack at two main points. The first point is close to the river. They will advance, they'll actually take the American line, but that's a diversion and the officer is killed, so there's nobody to reinforce the actual 
initial chop, the initial attack. The Americans push them back, retake the line. As we march across our field, all happening at about the same time, the next highlight is a British regiment, the 93rd Highlanders, are going to march across to where most of the British troops are, far end of our battlefield, and support the attack. Regrettably, their officer is killed, which is going to happen a lot. However, before he got shot, he ordered the command to stop, and they stopped. Now these troops facing us have just beaten Napoleon, so when they have an order to stop, they follow it, even if they're getting mowed down left and right. By the time somebody realizes what's going on, it's too late, and the brave Highlanders are absolutely, are absolutely decimated. The American general in charge over there, General Coffey, would remark about the poor old Highlanders that before they reached our small arms, our grape and canister, turning those cannons into giant shotguns, mowed down entire columns, but that was nothing compared to the carnage of our rifles and muskets. And General Coffey is not exaggerating. You blow off, you shoot off that cannon within a few hundred feet or yards of the British, one second you have a nice regiment, the, second, the next second half the regiment is lying dead on the field. Then they get within range of those and it gets even worse. Farther on down where that main attack is, if you want somebody to blame for it falling apart and the British will after the battle, uh, you can blame Lieutenant Colonel Mullins and the Irish 44th Regiment. He has a very simple order bring forward ladders to get across that American defense, and also bring bundles of sugar cane to throw in the canal to make a bridge. Unfortunately, he gets his orders, and he either doesn't follow it, or it's a misunderstanding, and he never does get the said order. Either way, he's a great scapegoat. So when the British attack, they reach the canal. Well, they, have br they brought their muskets, but they didn't bring forward the ladders, and they can't cross meaning that they just have to stand there and take the American fire. Now, when Packingham sees this, he is incensed. He rides forward to try to get some sort of order out of this mess. He is then shot and killed by American sharpshooters. Over on that side, we're going to have Kentucky and Tennessee militia and those Choctaw. Who wants to, now, if a turkey on the Kentucky or Tennessee frontier makes a nice target, does a British officer make a good target? The answer is yes. If these guys can shoot a deer or a turkey, the British officer with all the ranks of his, or with all the ranks probably displayed on his jacket, maybe a few medals, you bet they can take them out. At the end of the day, 75 officers are killed, captured, wounded, or missing. And there's nobody to tell you what to do. The British Army now has to retreat across the field. They're going to leave behind between 2,500 wounded, captured, killed, missing. And it's a devastating defeat for, again, the army that has just defeated Napoleon. On the American side, we have lighter casualties. Anybody want to guess how many did <coughs> not, or how, how many we suffered? is really close. Uh, it might be is one it 11? Yeah, it, it, it might be one or two under 20, but just about 20 on this day is total casualties. Yeah. As you can imagine, for that shouldn't have happened. The British have the better army, but we have the terrain and we have really good command. A few weeks later, the news arrives. The treaty has been signed and ratified. The war now ends. And Americans, just like the troops behind the defensive line, are going to start to unite around the victory as we end the war on a high note. And General Jackson will ride the laurels of victory he earns here all the way to Washington, becoming president in the 1820s. By the time he is president, the nation is now much more united, both internally and on the world stage. Our claims to all those western lands are now solidified, we're in a better spot. On the downside, even by Jackson's presidency, it is marked by some pretty awful relations with Native American nations, including some of those who fought under him during the battle. 
and all that nice western land like Louisiana Purchase that we now have a claim to, we already start to fight over how we're going to divide it up. Across the field is a Civil War cemetery, proving that the answer to that question is indeed not an easy one and far beyond the scope of this talk. However, it does show that the War of 1812 has a complex legacy and is still worth studying to understand the legacy and get an idea of how we identified as Americans in our early, early history. Now with that, you got plenty of time to see, the rest of, see most of the rest of the battlefield and the visitor center and its air conditioning is right across the parking lot. But any questions, myself or volunteers, that is why we are here.